before we begin today, we'll just offer some prayers because when we discuss spiritual knowledge, then the idea is that we need to open our heart to understand deeper things. So you can just fold your hands and we'll just pray together. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatyade Shatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Gibhavupad Ki <clears throat> so we chant this Hare Krishna mantra. This is a, actually an ancient sound vibration. This sound vibration is said to come from the spiritual world. And it's said that this sound vibration and the divine supreme person, God, is actually the same. So when you chant this mantra, or this sound vibration, when you hear it, it's actually like you're associating directly with God. And therefore it's said that even if you don't understand the meaning of the mantra, or you don't understand the philosophy behind it, even if you just hear the mantra, then the mantra is still having a big effect on your consciousness. Just like I often give the example, if I played one of your favorite songs from some years ago, then as soon as you hear the song, all the memories come back of that time in your life, isn't it? So similarly, right now we have forgotten that we are spiritual beings, that we live in the spiritual world, that we have a spiritual relationship with God. But when you hear this sound vibration, immediately it starts triggering all the memories of those things which otherwise you've forgotten. So, uh, can any of you say what, what you all been chanting Hare Krishna? You've experienced it a few times, maybe one time, five times, ten times. What was your experience when you chanted the Hare Krishna? the chanting, when you heard it, or when you chanted it, anything which happened to you, or which you felt? Anyone? Yes. Wait, before you go, it's possible to get some water. Thank you. Yes, what's your name? Moni. Moni? Moni. Moni. You naturally feel happy, it makes you feel joyful. Yeah, that's interesting. And was that the very first time you heard the mantra, you felt joyful? Yeah, I feel like I can smile, I can laugh, I can be happy. What was the, where was the first time you heard the mantra? I read it. Oh, and even when you read it, you felt joyful? Oh, wow, okay. Amazing. Good. Anyone else? How did it feel for you when you chant? <laughs> you feel spiritually uplifted. Yeah, yeah. Gets you free of your negativity, free of your limitation. You feel energized, hopeful. Yeah, good. 
Anyone else had a different experience? Once they asked Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, who founded the Hare Krishna movement, they asked him, what do you feel when you chant Hare Krishna? What do you feel? And you know what his answer was? I feel no fear. He actually said, I don't feel any fear anymore. Usually in our life, we're always fearful of different things. We're fearful about the future, we're fearful about our security, we're fearful about our health. But he said, when I chant Hare Krishna, I don't feel any fear. Because the idea is when you chant the mantra, you're coming in contact with the spiritual reality. And that means you transcend the material world and all the worries and anxieties of the material world as well. So it's very, very powerful in that way, you know, very powerful mantra. So as you chant more and more, uh, you won't just feel these effects of being calm, of being free from fear, of joy. These things will remain and you'll continue to feel this. But what you'll actually feel when you chant the mantra more and more is you'll actually feel a connection with God. You'll actually feel the presence of God. You'll feel like just as though today we're speaking and we're having a conversation with each other, you will feel when you chant that you're actually having a conversation with God in that way. So uh, it's very, very powerful. Do any of you have any questions on chanting or the process of the mantra or the meaning, thank you, sorry, or the meaning of the mantra or anything to do with chanting? Is it very clear to you? Yeah, you feel okay, you understand the process. You have any difficulties when you chant the Hare Krishna mantra? Is there anything that's uh, difficult for you or that you can't connect with so much? Yeah. Yeah, is there any practical arrangement you should make? Very good question, yeah. Very good question. What's your name, please? Patrick. Patrick? Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, is there any specific arrangement you should make to chant in a better way? Yeah, there is actually. You're right, when you're in the temple, when you're among spiritual people, when you're in this atmosphere and you chant, it's naturally much easier to connect. But if you go home, and you're not surrounded by this atmosphere, then how do you make the same connection? So there are a few things if you want your chanting to be powerful. First thing is, try to do it early in the morning. Because what happens early in the morning is there is less influence of the material surroundings. People have not begun to move, the atmosphere is still very quiet, and the energy of materialism isn't going so much through the atmosphere until later on in the day. So, first thing is, try to do it early in the morning. Second thing is, wherever you're chanting, try to make sure that the atmosphere, the environment is very clean. Have you noticed that when your environment is very congested or very untidy, then your mind tends to also be more congested and more disturbed. Have you noticed that? It's true, isn't it? So you try to keep a very clean environment wherever you meditate. And not just where you meditate, where you live generally. 
Second thing is the atmosphere try to make it so that there's fresh air and there's sunlight. Fresh air and sunlight are very, very important because what they're doing is they're also clarifying the consciousness. Isn't it? When the sun rises in the morning, naturally you feel more energized, isn't it? You feel naturally more clarity, more freshness. And then the fourth thing is, you can try to create some spiritual atmosphere around you by, for example, having pictures of Krishna or having pictures of spiritual teachers. You can also have things like incense. Do they sell incense at the temple? Yeah, yeah so you can take incense and you can burn it. I don't know how the rest of your family will feel if you do that. But the scent is also, because these are natural scents of the earth, sandalwood or, you know, different frankincense or different uh, smells of the earth. So it naturally puts you more in contact with nature. So if you do things like this and you arrange your chanting in this way, then you'll find that when you chant, you have more connection, actually. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyone else have any questions on chanting, how to improve chanting, or any difficulties you have while chanting? No? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, good. So today we got a bit of time, so we can have some questions and answers. So uh, Priya Govind sent me some questions. But before I go through these questions, which are apparently from all of you, um, some of you were maybe at the talk yesterday. I don't know if any of you had any questions from the talk yesterday. Did you have anything you... Were, ha, ha, put your hand up if you were at the talk yesterday. Okay, a few of you. Did you have any questions you wanted to ask from the talk or what we discussed yesterday? Was that clear? Or anything you want to follow up on that? Yeah, uh, Patrick. I want to ask a question on, uh, on a spiritual world. Mm -hmm. You see, um, there are so many religious and traditions, religions and traditions that are teaching different, uh, uh, different meaning in the spiritual world. For example, in my tradition, we believe the evil spirits and the good spirits and the idols and all this stuff. So, um, you see, these are things that we cannot, I cannot understand only on a physical realm. Uh, so, now that if you believe that uh, there, in, if you live a certain life, there is a high chances you connect with the evil spirit. And uh, even when a person dies and is able to come back and it can haunt one, it can haunt us. So, uh, what exactly is uh, in the spiritual world? Are they teaching correct this, this, this message or is there um, a specific um, reality? That one religion is right and the other one is wrong. Yeah. yeah, like that. Actually, we believe every religion in essence is teaching the same thing. Every religion teaches you that this world is not your true home. Every religion teaches you that there's a God and you have a relationship with Him. Every religion encourages you to chant, chant the names of God. Every religion encourages you to develop love for God and love for everything and everyone around you. So if you think about it, every religion, when you get to the essence of the message, they're basically teaching the same things. But what they differ on is certain parts of the philosophy and teaching some emphasize more than others and certain practices of different religions may differ in the way they do things. So for example, in, the, in some traditions there may be an emphasis talking about spirits and angels and you know demoniac influences and all these kinds of things. But what you'll find is that these concepts are also within all religions. Even in the Vedic scriptures, 
it talks about how different entities can be influencing us in this life. Right? So that's very much possible. But some religions will talk about and emphasize certain things more than others. So the point I'm making here is that every religion, when you get beyond the external differences, the core of and the purpose of every religion is the same. Yeah. So in that sense, there's a unity and diversity between the religions. Yeah. You want to follow up on that? It's clear. Beyond, beyond this world. Uh, beyond the uh, reality. Now, and these people, uh, they're just living normal lives like us. Mm -hmm. They're just doing their thing, their, their normal uh, uh, lives. So, such, uh, such people, are they affected in any way in their spiritual life? Or is it just true that now with them, they don't, they, they don't really have the best spiritual life? The same way they yeah, so is it that those people who don't believe in God or believe in anything higher, is it that they don't have any spiritual influences around them? or Everyone is affected by their environment. It doesn't matter whether you believe in it or you don't believe in it, isn't it? If you believe fire will burn you, it will burn you. If you believe fire don't, won't burn you, it will still burn you because it's a law of nature you understand so similarly yes there are spirits there are influences there are certain things in the world around us and it will affect people whether they believe it or they don't believe it and that's why a spiritual person is always better off because a spiritual person is more understanding the influences around them and then they can consciously arrange their life in such a way that rather than being influenced, they can influence the influences. You understand? So even a, even a materialistic person, they are influenced in a way that they can't understand. Have you noticed how sometimes materialistic people, they do things almost... They, um, forced to do it even when they don't want to do it. Can you can you think of an example? Yeah, I can give uh, a good example is Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Like okay. Elon Musk says you don't really believe in anything, you don't worship anything. Yeah. So he says he's um, he's just his work is just to do the things he's doing, the latest technology and improve in uh, the life of achieve a certain thing. Now, uh, in another interview, he said he, he was working so hard, so hard, such that he doesn't really recommend anybody to work the level. He doesn't level. recommend anyone to work that hard how he's working. He's, he says he's really forced to accomplish whatever test he has put in his uh, schedule. So in one sense, he has no higher purpose that he's working for, but still he's working so hard. So hard that he'd advise others not to do that. Exactly. So yeah, it seems that he's being influenced to work. Yeah. Yeah. He's really uncomfortable with the, the state at which he is, but still he's forced to, forced do, it. to do it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that's a very good example. So most people in this world, they're being influenced in a way that they can't understand. For example, people who have addictions, isn't it? They know it's not good for them to be addicted to intoxication or to be addicted to other things, you know, gambling. But still, it's almost like even though they don't want to do it, there's something within them which keep pushes them to do it. So therefore, when we read spiritual literature, then we begin to understand what are all these influences and forces that are affecting our life. And then we're more able to utilize our free will. Because everyone has free will. But the more and more that you're influenced, 
you can't actually exercise your free will. Yeah. yeah, when we talk about spiritual, it, it, it could have many connotations. If one person says spiritual, it's okay. If one person says spiritual, they may be thinking spiritual means ghosts, uh, demons, or angels, all of this kind of thing. Another person, when they say spiritual, what they're actually referring to is the reality which is beyond the material. So spiritual world doesn't just mean the places of spirits and ghosts, but spiritual world means the realm beyond this world where God exists and where we have a relationship with God and where we have um, interactions of loving relationship. You understand? So, um, so spiritual doesn't just mean like ghosts and all these things, but spiritual means the eternal reality beyond the temporary reality, where we exist and where we have a relationship with God. Yeah. Like in the Christian tradition, what they would call heaven. Yeah. In the Vedic tradition, they would call it the spiritual world. Yeah. Good. Any other questions from yesterday? At the back, do you have any questions from yesterday? Did it make sense? Good. Okay, so shall I read some of the questions from here? Okay, so the first question is, how can one prove that reincarnation is real? Yeah. So all of you understand the concept of reincarnation? This body that we have is a machine, but we are spiritual beings. When this body dies, we as the spiritual being, the soul, we move on to another body. Therefore, that is called reincarnation. Reincarnation is a, is a Latin word. Re means again. Uh, in means into. Carne means flesh. And ion means a process. So reincarnation literally means the process by which you come again into your flesh, into another body. So, how can we prove that we uh, have had previous lives? Right? So, there could be many, many different things which prove that we are separate from this body and that we've lived before. The very first thing we do when uh, school children come to our temple is we do an exercise with them. We tell them, you can do it with me, point to your eye. And point to your eye. Point to your right ear. Point to your nose. Point to your heart. Point to your head. Point to your elbow. Now point to yourself. <laughs> so he's going, some are going like this. Some are pointing here. So, so. Where are you pointing? Where do you think the self is? Yeah, but you. The self is in you. <coughs> so then, if the self is in you, who are you? <laughs> hmm? Who are you? The soul. So the self is inside the soul? In my body. So you are the soul inside your body. Is that what you're saying? The soul is in the 
The soul is in the body and you are the soul. Yes, exactly. Most people, when you ask them to point to themselves, intuitively they point here, generally, towards the heart region. Isn't it? Generally, that's where people point. Why do people point there? Because actually the scriptures say that the soul, but you're completely right, the soul, which is who we are, is situated in the heart region of the body. That's why I said that the heart is the seat of all energy in the body. I mean, the heart is the most important. When the heart stops beating, then that's it. It's finished. So according to the ancient teachers, the soul is residing within the heart region and we all have an intuitive understanding that we are not this body. Even if you look at the way people speak, they say my head, my arm, my mind, my body, my brain. Have you ever heard someone say I brain? or I body, no, it's my body, you're the owner, you're the possessor, you are not your body, but you are the one owning your body. So the, the second argument you can give people is that even intuitively in the way they speak, they understand that they are not this body, but they are the possessor of the body. When someone dies, what do they usually say? The person has gone or passed away. The person has passed away. But who's passed away? The body is still there. So clearly they understand that we're not this body, we were something more than the body. Do you know that science says every seven years, every cell in your body has changed? Did you know that? That means the body you have now and the body you had seven years ago is completely different. But you're still the same person, right? So you can say reincarnation is even happening in this life because the body is constantly regenerating and changing, yet you remain the same. Now, there's another phenomena which can help to prove reincarnation and that is the idea of past life memories. Have you ever met someone who remembers their previous life? Yeah, there are many people like this who remember their previous life. So there was one scientist, his name is Ian Stevenson. You can look it up on the internet. And he documented 5,000 cases of children who remember their previous lives. So when they're very, very young, they start recalling, I was this person, I lived in this place, I, uh, my parents' name was such and such, I did this job and I died in this way. They remember all the details. And then what he does is he goes back in history and he sees whether such a person existed. And he's documented 5,000 cases where children have remembered previous lives. Um, without any contact with that, that situation at all, spontaneously. That proves that how could they remember such a thing? How could they uh, recall such events? That proves that maybe this is not just the only life. Shall I tell you another thing which proves that there's more than just this life? Sometimes children are able to do things in this life that they've never learned in this life. Right? Later on when you go home today, you can check out something called xenoglossy. Have you ever heard of xenoglossy? X-E-N-O-G-L-O-S-S-Y, xenoglossy. You know what this is? This is, for example, Imagine a, a three-year-old child or four-year-old child in Africa begins to speak Chinese. <laughs> they just speak, begin speaking a language that they never learned in this life. How is that possible? That means clearly 
they are recalling something from a previous existence. Sometimes children even speak a language and they speak it in a dialect that's not even spoken on the earth at this point in time anymore. It's a very ancient dialect. There are also cases like that. How is that possible? That means that they must be accessing something from previous existences. So if you look at reincarnation, there's a lot of evidence to show that we are something separate from this body. For example, there's another scientist, you can look it up on the internet, his name is John Lorber. And what he's done is he's, he was like a, um, uh, a surgeon. John Lorber, L-O-R-B-E-R, I think his name is. I think he's the one. Either him or Francis Crick, one of them. I can't remember which one it was. But he was like a surgeon. You know these surgeons that do cardiac arrests. You know, so when someone has become unconscious and they do a cardiac arrest to try to create jump the activity again and when people come back to life out of a coma what he's documented is many many cases in which they had an out of body experience in other words they were able to see everything that was going on in the operating theater at a time when they were supposed to be clinically dead. So they, they start reporting, the doctor said this, this person said this, and then you tried this. And at this point in time, they're supposed to be clinically dead. But then what happens, they do the cardiac arrest, this person comes <coughs> back to life and they begin to document everything that was going on from a perspective outside of their own body. So this is known as OBEs or NDEs, out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences. So like this, there is a lot of empirical scientific evidence that this is not the only life, that this life is just one chapter of existence. Is that okay? You have any questions on that? Follow up question on that? Yes. Yeah, I just want to say that. <coughs> sorry. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's almost impossible for a Christian to believe in this reincarnation because the basis of our faith is, uh, is about somebody conquering death and Jesus things like that. Do you know that there were actually Christian theolo there were certain Christian theologians who believed in reincarnation? I'm forgetting the name now. Do you know, Govinda? There's many passages in the Bible that speak about reincarnation. Yeah. For example, when Jesus was walking with his disciples, so he asked the disciples, who do the, who do the men say I am? And they replied, some say you're John the Baptist or Elijah who has come back again. So the aspect of coming back again is the aspect of reincarnation. Mm. There is a theory, there were many Christian theologians who believed in reincarnation. And there is a theory, I don't know how much truth there is to that theory, but even among certain Christian theologians, they say that reincarnation was taken out of Christianity because there was a fear that people would become complacent. That anyway, I got another life. If I don't make it in this life, I can make it after. So they, <laughs> so they didn't want them to become complacent. And they wanted to, through this uh, a sense of fear, tell people that, okay, this is it. This is one life. And if you don't uh, surrender, then you, you know. But here, let me ask you another question. God must be all compassionate, right? God is all compassionate. You agree? I mean, of course, must be. 
Now, would an all-compassionate God subject you to eternal damnation with no opportunity to redeem yourself forever and ever and ever with nothing coming good from it? Or would you think God, if you make a mistake, would put you in another situation which is worse, but a situation in which you can learn something and eventually come out again? Which God to you sounds more compassionate? The one that eternally damns you for the rest of eternity? It's, it's a little difficult to conceive of a God that would just make you suffer and suffer and suffer for eternity with nothing good coming from it. Yeah, 100%. That we agree. That God has his standards and God has his ideals for how we should live. But the question is, if you don't live up to those ideals, for whatever reason, would you be subjected to eternal suffering? Suffering makes sense from a compassionate God when there's something that comes from that suffering which helps you to again find happiness then the suffering that comes from a compassionate God makes sense but when there's suffering given by a so-called compassionate God which has nothing which then takes you again back to happiness you begin to think what kind of person would subject you to suffering for the rest of eternity it, it, it brings some serious theological questions. I'll give you another question. Say a baby is born, and then a baby dies after one hour. Where does that baby go? Heaven or hell? Whichever one you say, it also does it, it brings a serious theological question. Because if you say the baby goes to hell, it's like it never had a chance. And then if you say the baby goes to heaven, then you say like it got a free ticket to heaven without having to do anything. So then how is God equal? Why didn't God give me that chance? Why do I have to struggle in this world for 100 years with so many temptations, so many distractions? I wish I could have just gone straight to heaven also. It doesn't seem like an equal God. So if you take reincarnation out of the picture, you begin to have serious theological complexities that are very difficult to answer. I'll give you another one. One of the biggest philosophical questions people have in the world today is why do bad things happen to good people? There is a whole subject of philosophy just about this one question and it's called theodicy. And if you don't believe that the suffering of this life is framed within many, many other lives, and that the suffering of this life is just one chapter of a longer story, if you believe this life is the all in all, then it becomes very difficult to answer the question of why bad things happen to good people. But when you understand that this life is a chapter, then that theological question doesn't have the same puzzling effect because it becomes clear. The suffering that you're going through here is part of a longer story that you can't see. So the point I'm making here is that when we begin to see that this life is a chapter, then what that begins to do is open up many, many avenues to understand and unravel philosophical and theological questions that otherwise people just have no idea how to deal with.
Shanti. Yes, the gentleman in the red, what's your name? Limo. Limo. Yes, go for it. Finish the question, yeah, go on, carry on. Yeah, 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 sure. Like, um, Christian, you've read the Bible. Our you parts? Know, some parts, you know, about Jesus. Yeah, 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 of course. You know, yeah. Jesus dying on the cross. Yes, Jesus dying on the cross, yes. yes. So Jesus died on the cross for the sins of all Christians. For us to, so that we can be given a second chance to, to repent and ask God for forgiveness. Like, he gave it all for us on the cross. So what I'm trying to say is that we were in existence before he died for us. So you're saying there is reincarnation. Yes. If they haven't committed them yet. So I'm going like him because I committed the sins before long ago. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point actually. Jesus died yeah. for my sins. Yeah. When I'm in this, so when I get born, I can be able to ask for forgiveness because he died for my sins. So like I have that like physical thing. I understand what you're saying, yeah. So you're saying in one sense we can say in Christianity there is a concept of reincarnation. Yeah. Because Jesus couldn't have died for sins that you haven't performed yet. But I think many Christians would respond to that by saying Jesus died on the cross for even sins that people would commit in the future. <laughs> That's what many Christians would say. Right? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. So what happens is there are three aspects to our identity. We are the soul. We have a physical body, what we see in the mirror. And we also have a subtle body, which is the mind and the intelligence and the ego. So what happens when you reincarnate is that the soul is carried by the subtle body to the next gross body. And that explains why people still can remember things from previous lives or why we all come into this world with different personalities, different inclinations, different uh, abilities, because we are carrying things from previous lives in our mind and intelligence. Does that make sense? So there are three aspects to our identity, the soul, the subtle body, and the physical body. So say you can use the example of a computer. Imagine I have a computer in front of me, then the keyboard and the monitor, that's like the physical body. And then me sitting behind the computer, moving it, that's like the soul. But what do you need for someone to operate a computer? What do you need on the computer? Electricity, Electricity and also software. software. So the mind is like software. It becomes the interface between the soul and the physical body. So at the time of death, the physical body is left behind. But the subtle body, the mind, intelligence, ego, and the soul, they go to the next, so next physical body. Does that make sense? And therefore, if you want to know what is a ghost, a ghost is basically a soul 
that has a subtle body but no gross body. It's basically a disembodied entity. So in the period between when someone dies and then they take birth in their next life, there's a period in which they are a disembodied living entity. So that transition takes place from one body to the next. That's why in spiritual cultures, when someone dies, they cremate the body, they burn the body. Why? Because when you burn the body, then it encourages the soul to move on to its next destination. Understand? Otherwise, the soul keeps trying to go back in. It's very frustrated. Any other questions on reincarnation? Yes. And then we'll come to you. Sure. What happens to a person yep. if he does not take up Krishna consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> what happens to a person if he doesn't take up Krishna consciousness? Uh, he'll continue on in this life and he'll continue to be reincarnated in different bodies according to activities. So you just keep coming back to the world. It, it, and until and unless we become conscious of God, unless we understand who we are, who is God, what is our relationship with Him, and unless we develop our love for God, most importantly, if we don't do that by the end of this life, then what happens is God arranges for us to come back to this world in another place, in another set of relationships, to go through another set of experiences, to try to come to that point of understanding who we are. So if one doesn't come to spiritual consciousness or love, divine love for God, then they just get reborn in the world in a different situation to get another opportunity to awaken their consciousness. Does that make sense? It's like, for example, if I say to you, are you at, you at university? No. Okay, but you're at university at one point. What happens if you fail your exam? <laughs> you, have, you have to sit it again, right? You have to come back and sit the exam again. So until you sit the exam, you can't graduate from the university. So it's like that. You keep coming back to try to re take lessons again to understand the purpose of life. Yeah. Want to say something more? No. Happy? That's a good question. Yeah. You become a bear. Yeah. So is reincarnation a reward or punishment? In one sense, we can say, yeah, uh, it's a, you get reincarnated into a situation according to your karma. So according to your activities and your desires from previous lives, you're reincarnated into a new situation. And that situation may include good things and bad things depending on what you've done to come into that situation. But we can say reincarnation is always in one sense a reward because reincarnation is always another opportunity to reawaken your spiritual consciousness. So it's like a, another chance. Yeah, good question. So basically, there are 8.4 million species of life. They're like aquatics, mammals, and then humans, and then higher entities. 
So what it is, is it said that the soul evolves from different life forms. And up until the human life form, the soul just goes automatically through species. So for example, you live out your life as a bear, then you go to the next species, you live that life out, you go live out that species, you live that one out, next one, next. and then when you come finally to the human form, because in the human form you have advanced intelligence, you can discriminate. And then at the human form, according to how you use your free will, you can either go down again or you can go up. So reincarnation up until the human form is automatic. Because animals don't have that kind of discrimination to access higher knowledge. But when you're a human, you do. But if you don't use that discrimination as a human, then again you go down. And then you have to wait for the automatic, until you get the opportunity of a human form. Therefore, the opportunity to live in the human form of life is very, very rare. It took many millions of births to get to this point of being a human. But then what happens is people come to the form of a human and then what do they do? They basically live like an animal again. They don't utilize their intelligence for higher things. And therefore then they go back down again. Therefore there's a Sanskrit verse. Ahara nidra bhaya me tunam cha Samana me tat pashubi samanaha Dharmo hite sho adiko vishe sho Dharme nahina pashubi samanaha The animals and humans they have four things in common. Animals eat, humans eat. Animals sleep, humans sleep. Animal defends themselves. Human defends themselves. And animals mate and humans mate. So what's the special advantage of a human? They have intelligence. But if they utilize their intelligence just to do eating, sleeping, mating, defending in a more complicated way, then actually they're just polished animals. That intelligence should be used to inquire what is the purpose of life. understand <coughs> reincarnation has an end as soon as you realize who you are who is God your relationship of love with him then you go back to the spiritual world then there's no more reincarnation Reincarnation is just keeping, giving you an opportunity to understand, realize yourself. Once you realize yourself, there's no more reincarnation. I'll come to you, just go in at the back. Yeah, I just wanted to add something for clear understanding. You said before the Abrahamic tradition came to Africa, where people were living. <coughs> So let's say uh, in, the, in the theology of Christianity it says that there is something known as the Day of Judgment. So when the Day of Judgment comes and the Messiah is coming, and the people who lived before the Abrahamic tradition came to Africa, they wake up from their dream, and they ask the Messiah, why are you judging us? Is it our fault that we didn't use this philosophy before he came? Why are you judging us? So if we, if we remove the aspect of reincarnation, then why would those people be judged and punished or rewarded? Because they didn't meet the philosophy from before. So on what principle will they be judged, basically? So therefore, reincarnation makes more sense. That whatever you do, you get, a, you get as a reward for it, or you get a punishment according to one's free will and choice. So I just wanted to put that in. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Wonderful. Um, okay. Go 
What does it look like? This world is a reflection of the spiritual world. There cannot be anything in this world that's not in the spiritual world. Imagine you see a tree and then there's a river. Then what do you see in the river? The reflection of the tree. There can't be anything in the reflection that's not there in the tree. If there's no apple in the tree, you ain't going to see any apple in the reflection, right? Because there can't be. It's just a... So anything you see in this world is basically just a reflection of the spiritual world. So how is the spiritual world? It's just like this. There's trees, there's birds, there's lakes, there's people, there's love, there's family, there's laughter, there's joking. There's sports, everything. But it just means all of the negativity and all the materialism of this world is completely absent. So it, it, the spiritual world is a, is a, is a sentient world of full of people. God is a person. You see? Just like we are, how can we, like they say in Christianity, Man is made in the image of the light, image of God. So how can we have a form, but God doesn't have a form? Of course God has a form, therefore we also have a form, because we're made in His image, and we have a relationship of love with Him. So imagine this world in its most perfect way, full of selflessness, and kindness and tolerance and that's the spiritual world does that make sense yeah yes sir good question why is it that some children and they're very rare why is it that some children remember and some don't you see Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita he says from me comes knowledge remembrance and forgetfulness so he said that God is also residing in your heart and from him remembrance of certain things may come about and why does God give a certain remembrance to certain individuals? Because for those individuals, remembrance of that previous thing is going to play some role in their spiritual development. By nature's way, most of us, 99.9% .9 of us, at the time of birth, our memory is reset. It said that the experience of being born in this world is so traumatic that it resets your memory and that's an arrangement of nature why because if you remembered your previous life and all the details it would be very difficult to function in this identity i mean just imagine you all of you are men imagine if you're in your previous life you're a lady and you remember everything it would be it would create an identity crisis you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to live like a normal person. So most of us forget. But Krishna, what he might do for certain individuals is give flashes of memories of previous life in order to help them on their journey.
But actually, in another way, everyone is remembering certain things from their previous life. You may not remember who you are, were in your previous life, or where you lived, or who your mother or father was, but you're remembering lessons from your previous life. Why is it that um, some people just know, like, I can't harm someone else. That's not a nice thing to do. Whereas some people, they need to be taught that. Why is that? Because you're remembering lessons from a previous life already. You've become evolved in certain ways. Why is it that uh, Mozart, you know Mozart, the famous musician, how is it that Mozart could compose symphonies at the age of five? They didn't learn that in this life. So they're already remembering a previous life, may not remember who they were or what. Makes sense. So in one sense, everyone is remembering their previous life, but some will remember specific identities because we can say that that is useful for them on their journey. But for most people, it's not useful, and therefore we don't remember. That could be linked. That could be linked to a previous life. Or it just could be linked to a previous memory of something very, very similar that's triggering, you know. But yeah, that, that could also be previous lives. It happens with places. Sometimes it also happens with people. You meet someone for the first time, but it almost feels like you've known them for many, many times, it's a very natural connection, although you're meeting them for the first time. So it could happen with people, it could happen with places, it could also happen with experiences. Sometimes someone is put in a certain experience and they immediately know how to respond to it. Even though they've never gone through that experience in this life, because probably previously they have some memory. So yes, yeah, that, that's also there. We have flashes of memories from our previous lives as well. Yeah. Any more questions on reincarnation? Yes. So I just wanted to uh, understand this. You spoke about the gross body and the subtle body. You said the subtle body is the soul and The subtle body is not the soul. No, the soul, sorry, the so, uh, uh, the soul uh, when it uh, <laughs> moves with the subtle body, yeah. Uh, uh, then it carries the mind, intelligence, and the ego. So you told us the mind is the software. If you could, for example. Uh, no, we can say the whole, uh, the whole kind of oper uh, software of the computer is all three. But I guess you're asking, what's the difference between the mind, intelligence, and ego? So the mind is like a memory. It's like a storehouse of memories. So the mind is just, it, it carries all the impressions and all the experiences from previous lives. And then the intelligence is the part of the subtle body which uh, we use to discriminate. The mind is coming up with all kinds of memories, impressions, ideas, and then the soul has to then, uh, the intelligence has to discriminate. And then the ego is like the glue, because ego means identity. So the ego is like the glue of the um, subtle body to the gross body, or the subtle body to the soul. It's, it's that which glues the soul, the subtle body, and the gross body together. It gives a sense of identity. Another easy way to think of it is like this. If you think of a horses and chariot, 
Then imagine there's a chariot, two people sitting on it, and there's horses. Then the horses are like the senses. The reins are like the mind. The driver is like the intelligence, and the passenger is the soul. And the chariot is the body. So basically, the soul is controlling the intelligence, the intelligence is controlling the mind, the mind is controlling the senses, and in that way the chariot is going on. But today in most people's lives, it's not going from that way, the control is not coming from the soul to the senses, the control is coming from the senses, the other way. So therefore people, they don't have any intelligence. It's all out of control. The driver is sleeping, the reins are out of control, the passenger you know, is helpless, and the horses are just running where they want to run. And that's basically modern civilization. Because people have no concept of who they are. This initial question you raised about influence. To the next gross body, yeah. From the gross body. Now, when this person is being born, uh, he's in mind reset. And, uh, uh, not the mind resets. Impressions are still there in the mind, but our ability to access them is covered. So it's, it's not that you completely like forget everything. The, the memories are still there. But what's reset is your um, connection with the identity of a previous life. That is lost. But the memories of that life and the different experiences and impressions, that continues. Otherwise, then what do you learn from a previous life? You don't learn anything. That's why sometimes people ask the question, what's the point of experiencing certain things in this life, reactions, if you can't remember the actions of previous lives that created these reactions? But you're still learning from previous lives that you don't remember because the impressions are left in the subtle body. So you're still learning. Maybe not consciously, but you're learning because it's in the subtle body. There was a question back there. To come back to this world and not be affected by things. <laughs> so once one becomes a spiritually realized soul, can they decide to come back to this world but in such a way that they don't get affected by things, but just to enjoy the good things? They don't create karma. There's only one reason why a spiritually realized soul would ever come back to this world. There's only one reason. You know what that is? Exactly. To help others get out. They're really, for a spiritually realized soul here, there's nothing to enjoy. Because enjoyment is with God. So 
So why would you want to leave the playground of God and come and enjoy like an avocado in Eldoret? <laughs> it's like, okay, it's a nice avocado, but God is amazing. Why would you want to? So you see what I mean? But they would come to Eldoret out of compassion to say like, but all of these people don't know and therefore I should share with them. See, and that is my service to God, my exhibition of love for God. So this world only exists for souls who want to try to enjoy separately from God. Once you realize that real happiness comes from doing everything in connection with God, there's no reason why you would ever want to be disconnected from that reality save and accept for the purpose of serving others. It just no, holds no more attraction. There's no attraction here. Does that make sense? A male body, yeah. Um, could be, not necessarily. There could be other reasons why people uh, have different sexual persuasions and other psychological factors which create, um, create that desire within different living beings. But definitely you're right, it could also be to do with um, previous experiences and perhaps previous attachments to previous identities that they haven't quite let go of yet and that they are still continuing to try to live out even when their um, body has changed. Yeah, that's a good observation, that's true. That could help to explain this. Yeah. Good point, thank you. So the men want to be women in this way to serve, and the women want to become men. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah. Mm. Is it possible that I think I used to uh, position the wife to the material world? Material world? Um, well, we were all there. We all moved from the spiritual world to the material world. Oh, in the form of a messenger. Yes, that's true. Yeah, definitely. Like I was saying to the gentleman at the back, the only reason why someone, a soul, spiritually realized in the spiritual world would come to this world, the only reason would be to share knowledge. So that's possible. That's why we would say someone like Jesus is not someone who came here to enjoy. Jesus is someone who came here to give knowledge of God so that people could reawaken their spiritual consciousness. Therefore, we call such people a prophet or a messenger or... Oh, very good question. Yeah. So very quick, 
summary of the cosmology. This material world is made up of many, many universes. Yeah, there's not just one universe, there's many universes. In the beginning, scientists used to think there's just one universe. And then later on, they came up with this idea of multiverse, that there are many universes. So the Vedic teachings say there are many universes. Within one universe, it's considered that every universe is like an egg, egg-shaped. And in the one universe, there are 14 planetary systems. Seven are higher, seven are lower, and then there is the middle, which are known as the earthly planets. So we are in one universe, and we are in this universe, we're in the middle, right in the middle. And uh, on these universes, there are different species of life. So in the lower planets, there are species. In the higher planets, there are species. And on this earth, there are 8.4 million species. So the reason why all of this variety is created is because there are infinite number of souls who have an infinite number of desires and therefore they all require their own special situation which will help them to elevate their consciousness. Does that make sense? And therefore, uh, yes, there are, there are different species, there are different planets, there are different universes because these are all specifically tailor-made experiences for each soul to elevate their consciousness. Does that answer your question? At the back, there's a question. Why did this system get set up in the first place? If you were originally with God, how did we end up here in the first place? <laughs> how did the whole thing start? It's a very good question. The spiritual world exists on love. In the spiritual world, we have a relationship of love with God, right? In the spiritual world, ev everyone is there because they love God. Now, in order for love to exist, one thing has to exist. Can love ever be forced? No. Love has to be voluntary. And for love to be voluntary, it means that God gives you one thing which he never takes away. And what is that? Free will. Free will. So you can only exist in the spiritual world in a relationship of love with God if you have free will. So it's said that each one of us were initially with God living in a relationship of love by our own free will. But free will means that at any point you could desire something else. Now you may say, but if you're with God, it's so wonderful, why would you ever want to desire anything else? But it's said that the soul, some souls, at some point in their journey, they develop a curiosity. Like what would it be like to be separate from God? It's not that they're dissatisfied, but just curiosity. So as soon as there's a curiosity, God doesn't force anyone to stay there. Because otherwise, that would be forced. It, love has to be. So then it's said that God creates the material world as an opportunity for us to misuse our free will, if we so desire. But what he does when he creates this world is he creates a system so that eventually we can get back. 
Now you may say, wow, for one small mistake, just some curiosity, now I'm trapped in this world as a rat, as a cat, as a bat, <laughs> as a human. You see, but right now to us, because we're in it, it feels like such a big thing. But actually this is just a flash in eternity. This world is like a bad dream. You know, sometimes you have a nightmare. And sometimes you like you're in this nightmare and it just seems endless and then you wake up and it feels like you were in that nightmare for years but then you look at your watch and you realize you are just sleeping for about 10 minutes but when you're in the nightmare it feels endless so right now for us this feels like a big journey but in the context of eternity it's just a flash and the reason the world exists is because we wanted it. Man proposes, God disposes. So therefore, technically, it's not God that creates the world. Technically. We create the world. And then God engineers it because we wanted it. So this world didn't start by God's desire. This world started by our desire. And God therefore created it as a, as a school, as a university, so that we can learn lessons and eventually go back. Does that make sense? Okay. We have to finish? Yes, we have to finish. Oh. <laughs> Is this material world a reality or a dream? It's a dream-like reality. <laughs> no, it's real. It's not that this is actually happening. We are here. This is not an illusion. We are here. We're here in Eldoret. This is real. It's not a dream. But we can say it's a dream in the sense that it's just temporary. For something to be truly real, it has to be eternal. So the material world is not an eternal place. It's a temporary place. And in that sense, it's not real. But it is real in the sense that, yes, we are here, we are experiencing this, we are going through this. But eventually, we'll realize that this material world is actually unreal because it's temporary. Reality in its truest sense must always be existing for it to be reality. But still, this is real. This is not an illusion. <laughs>